I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and I'm joined today across the table by two veterans of the show, Jaden Quinlan and Matt Ritchie. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Absolutely, guys. So we're talking less serious stuff here. You know, normally on Quinlan's Corner or when Matt Ritchie's involved, usually we're talking about, you know, something technical, something long range or whatever. But it's the fall. It's cold outside. We're waking up. There's frost out there. It's hunting season, but that also means, man, coyotes are going crazy. They're out there. Yeah. They're looking for food. And there is few things more universal than if you see a coyote, you must shoot it. Yeah. You know, that's kind of, I just, I don't know, maybe it's where I grew up or where we grew up kind of in that same, you know, obviously Jaden's from Colorado, Matt and I from out here uh, in the Great Plains, but it's a universal, like, if you see a coyote, go ahead and kill it. Even if you're asking permission to hunt somebody's land, nope, we don't want any hunting. But if you're driving by and you see a coyote out there, go ahead and jump out. Free game. game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sunday morning, going to church. There's a coyote. We're stopping. <laughs> Put it down. Yeah. Uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, we joke about it, but it's a lot of fun and a lot of people take it real serious. So uh, I want to get you guys away from the long range stuff and the technical stuff that we normally hit out. And let's talk cartridge and bullet selection and thoughts for predator hunting. You know, bobcats will throw in there, but more specifically, I mean, coyote hunting is such a, a prolific, I'm going to call it sport, but pastime, you know, yeah. for all of us. So uh, maybe, Jaden, how'd you get into coyote hunting? Because you've got quite a background in it. Yeah, I grew up in the middle of nowhere in southern Colorado um, on a farm and ranch, about a thousand acres. And yeah, I mean, one of your one of your jobs as a kid out there is to take care of stuff that gives you a hard time on the farm, whether that's prairie dogs digging holes in the fields, you know, breaking horses' legs and stuff, or coyotes when it's calving season, you know, that's a, that's a big issue. So, um, I started hunting coyotes for that reason. And then, um, obviously fell in love with it. I mean, I love chasing elk. I love chasing deer, but I'll be honest when I get a coyote coming into a call, or like you said, I'm driving around and I see one, I get a little more excited than I do with an elk or a deer. I mean, that's kind (laughs) of wrong to say, but it's true. I don't know why, but the fact that they're a little bit, they're just different. They're a predator, you Mm -hmm. know? So my interaction with them mentally is different than it is with an elk or a deer. Yeah. There's more of a game to it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I started shooting them, you know, as a, essentially a nuisance control growing up on the farm. And then, um, back then there was still a, a hide value for them, bounty and, and hide. And I lived far enough away from where I went to school that it was like, you know, 70 or 80 miles round trip a day to school. So like high school, you know, when you get your yeah. own vehicle and stuff, you're paying for gas. And, and I found out that, Hey, if I buckle down and get good at this coyote hunting stuff, I could generate some gas money from it. So my high school years, I did that pretty heavily. And so there was a bounty on them. So not only were you selling them for their hide value, mm-hmm. you could actually turn what a foot or an ear or how'd that go? I think it was a, it was either ear and tail or maybe one or the other or combo or something. I don't remember. I really didn't do that much because you had to take it to the courthouse, Okay. which there was a fur trader that would come down every so often and he would give me the bounty price plus the fur price. Oh, because I could have just turned it into the courthouse, you know, but then he would have never had the opportunity at the hide. So he'd pay guys for both. Nice. But I mean, I'd make, I don't know, 40 to $70 on a coyote. I mean, you go out on a on a weekend, make sure all your homework's done, you know, so you can devote the whole yeah. weekend to Chores it. Chores are you, done. If yep. you can bag a couple coyotes, I mean, back then that was enough gas to last you a couple of weeks. Awesome. So growing up doing that, what was your cartridge of choice? And I, I think I know your answer only because I know your past a little bit, but <laughs> uh, what were you shooting the coyotes with? Uh, I started out, my first rifle was a twenty two Magnum. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marlin, I don't remember the name of it. I still have it, but um, started shooting them with that and then... Obviously, that left some capabilities on the table, um, and so I met uh, who became a lifelong friend and mentor, Mark. You know, mm-hmm. Mark. Oh yeah. He taught me how to hunt big game growing up. When I was, I think, twelve or thirteen, he asked me, "Hey, if you could have any, I think it was for Christmas, around Christmas time." You know, he's like, "Hey, if you could have any rifle, what would it be?" And I had it specked out. I knew oh, exactly yeah. what I wanted. You yeah. know, and it was a twenty-six inch bull barreled Remington seven hundred and a two twenty-three Remington. Yeah. I told, and it, I gave him all the specs and guess what I got for Christmas? He Dude. hooked me up with that. And 
that, we were that rifle's to you, Mark. probably yeah. the reason I'm here today. That yeah. that rifle made me fall in love with ballistic. That's awesome. So. That's cool. I thought you were going to say thirty out six. Well, I did. <laughs> that was my first. Uh, that was my first. I guess center fire. Yeah, was a thirty out six from Mark as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did shoot some coyotes with the thirty out six with some hundred and eighty grain spire points. Beautiful prone. <laughs> yeah, of course, just eating it. Um, One hundred and sixty pound Jaden just yeah, 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 fifteen just years old it. getting hammered. <laughs> Jeez. But then uh, you know that led into that two twenty three. Yeah. Awesome. And the two twenty three. I mean, obviously that's killed. I, I don't, don't know how know. many. We, we named it Black Death. Yeah. I mean, it was a black stock and, you know, a black barreled action and stuff. And, yeah, the amount of prairie dogs and coyotes that thing's killed is a lot. I still have it. It still shoots. I don't know how. 18-inch barrel, right, or 20? You no, cut it was it down. 26. I cut it down when I when I took the I job remember. here. Yeah. yeah, so it was a little bit more handy. But Threaded. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, yeah, it does still shoot because you had it out not that long ago. Yeah, we were, with, a, with a 55 VMAX, which is what I always used back then. I mean... It, it still pounds. I don't know how there's rifling left in the thing. Yeah. But uh, awesome. Now, Matt, what got you into the coyote hunting biz and, uh, what were you shooting them with? Yeah. So starting out, um, on the ranch and everything like that, but even predating that in high school, um, my now father-in-law, he had some videos of a Nebraska guy and they were called verminators for predator or prey, um, calling all coyotes. And that, you know, started out watching that and it was like, I could do that. That looks like fun. And like yeah. Jaden alluded to, it is so much funner. I mean, for me, you know, getting your heart racing, it is so much funner calling coyotes because you are outsmarting another predator. Like their whole goal is to come in and eat whatever that sound is. And you're outsmarting them to get mm-hmm. them in within range. And so that was always the the lure to do it. But then as I grew up and got out in the uh, workforce, um, working for cattle ranchers and farmers and everything like that, you had, you know, depredation. They were killing calves. and you know, that was the main thing, you know, and as you're kicking cows or feeding, you know, grinding hay for, for cattle in the winter time, and you've always got a rifle. I don't know a rancher in Nebraska that doesn't have a, a truck gun, yeah. you know? And so you always had something with you to pop a shot off at a coyote. Cause like, you know, you saw them, they, you got shot at, they got shot at. And that was the, you know, you got them. Sometimes you got them, sometimes you didn't, but you darn sure scared them. Yeah. You, know? you, had, you had a responsibility at yeah. that point. I mean, you get a calf on yeah. the ground, that's. That's yeah, 600, money, 700 bucks yeah, right there. Taking money out of, out of the pocket of these guys that own these cattle. And so that's my responsibility as a, as a caretaker is to make sure that the things that want to eat them are not able to do that as easy. So, mm-hmm. But I started out the first um, rifle that I had was my dad's Remington 788 and 22250 <laughs> with a Tasco scope on it. It had a little bit higher magnification, but I just kind of claimed that as my own mm-hmm. and had that for forever, then worked up to a 243, but that 22250 was with me everywhere. Yeah. I had that thing and 50 to 55 grain V maxes. And unlike J- Jaden's 22223, the throw is shot out of that 22250. <laughs> a 55 grain V max, when you use our OAL gauge, the bullet leaves the neck. There's no throw yeah. left in it, it's gone. <laughs> and, and so I got it in the safe. It's kind of a, a project that I want to fix up for my dad redo it and everything like that well but, you owe it to him after exactly it out. Yeah. <laughs> i shot my first i shot coyotes my first deer with that rifle i mean yeah it's it's kind of near and dear to my heart but it's uh that was the what i used and yeah obviously i'm kind of a six millimeter guy now so that's what i i run now but okay v maxes or spire points you know that's what i always shot them with so perfect well in the 22 250 just like the 223 i mean there are a few more iconic predator cartridges yeah. than that one i mean that thing is just at the speed of light if you can see him you can hit him for the most part i yep. mean that 22 has been pretty storied and as we uh kind of change gears into talking about cartridge selection um that one will definitely get brought up um so it's neat to see that you guys have a very similar backstory of like yeah it, not only is it fun but we also kind of had an obligation to do it and yeah. for me it's the exact opposite um they were always just a target of opportunity if we were hunting or out jacking around or whatever doing yeah. you know whatever we were doing growing up yeah you see cut you're gonna you're gonna shoot it yeah. but it was never like oh i'm gonna can't wait to go out this weekend i'm gonna wake up early and get out there and call coyotes it never really was our thing i just never was exposed to it if i was i'm sure i would have been all about it but yeah um the the followers of this show will know my first rifle is a 257 robert so I shot my first coyote with the 257 bob and then after that it really it's almost kind of been a joke between me and my dad Every year, 
since probably 2014 or 15, um, me and my dad go on some sort of hunt together. Usually it's mule deer. Um, it's been antelope. Um, but it's almost a joke that when I go hunting with him, I have to kill a coyote because <laughs> as a target of opportunity, it's, you know, we're out there pursuing, you know, mule deer in the sand hills or out West or eat antelope. You're going to see them and they're yeah, just a target of opportunity. And perfect time to break the, knock the rust off. You know, you <laughs> yeah. haven't hunted all summer. Hey, coyote, let's, let's put him down first and then, yeah. then go after these antelope or deer. Yeah. yeah. So from, uh. Uh, a necessity standpoint, that's one thing, but a lot of people do this for enjoyment. Like you guys mentioned, when you call them in, you know, uh, getting able to stop a coyote, spitting in your hand and just kissing your palm, mm-hmm. stopping a coyote. That's so amazing. But there's a lot of money to be made in the competitive coyote calling world. Have yeah. either of you guys done any coyote calling competitions? Yeah, a little bit. More so since I, you know, have been out here in Nebraska and working here. They didn't really have as many when I was a kid growing up, or maybe they did. I just didn't know about them. Um, but they're, they're, they're a challenge. That's for sure. I mean, yeah. the, the competition is pretty steep. Like you said, there's a, there's a lot on the table at those things. Yeah. I've not, I've not gotten into it, um, mainly cause I've always just had a full-time job and now a lot of those are going to 24 hour, yeah. you know, 48 hour hunts or, or competitions and just, I'm not going to sacrifice my sleep, yeah. <laughs> you know, especially in something that, that is that competitive to where, you know, guys are killing 20 plus dogs in yeah. 24 and making 30, oh, yeah. thousands yeah. of dollars. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of, now I don't want to say cutthroat, but people are hyper competitive. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. it, I do have some friends and, uh, even some folks that have been on the podcast, Tate Streeter, yeah. um, proprietor of impact actions and a phenomenal PRS shooter, just a great all around guy. And, uh, you know, we, one of our sponsored shooters and he's a good friend of ours, um, in Oklahoma and they, they burn it down out there and he is darn good at what, you know, what he does. Um, but yeah, around here we do have some, you know, even Hornady is involved in one. We do it locally here. Um, but yeah, when you're sacrificing sleep, you got to really want it. Yeah. Yeah. So from a cartridge standpoint, uh, maybe we should talk about bullets first before we get into cartridge selection. So walk us through what you guys look for in a, in a coyote bullet. Uh, or predator bullet, you know, like I said, bobcats are obviously in their wolves, but we don't have those here in Nebraska anyway. And so uh, from a coyote standpoint, what are you guys looking to shoot from a bullet standpoint? Well, fur damage is a big consideration, especially when I was a kid and, and getting a bounty. I mean, if I select the wrong bullet, let's say like an FMJ or a Bowtail hollow point design or something that wouldn't expand, um, and you, you end up having an exit wound that's fairly large or tears the height up or something, or you, you catch a leg bone or something like that and it tears the height up. I mean, you really get docked for that. So, um, I think I, I shot a couple coyotes early on with, uh, with an FMJ, you know, as a kid, that's cheaper ammo, right? Sure. The the 223 loaded with a 55 FMJ. Gotta kill more coyotes to buy the good stuff. But A, the terminal performance isn't good. So you lose them, right? You, you make a shot and it just pokes a pencil hole through them. So they run off. Mm -hmm. Um, but B, you can really damage the hide a lot worse. And so when I found the 55 grain V Max, that once I found that and shot a couple coyotes with it, it was awesome because they died where I shot them. I didn't have fur damage. They were accurate. They were flat shooting. You know, everything that I was that I was looking for, but I was too young to know I was looking for it. You I, just knew that's I can I can yeah, play with that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're shooting V Maxes across the board. Now when you look at different uh diameters, different calibers, are you sticking with the with the V Max? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I would. Say, so today, you know, I talked a little bit about what I did as uh, in the past, but today you mentioned being a six millimeter guy. I've transitioned yeah. to that as well. Um, and yeah, the six millimeter VMAXs should not be overlooked. I think the twenty two cal is still probably the majority of what's used between two twenty three and twenty two two fifty. I mean, you can't argue with that cartridge's performance, especially with a VMAX in it. Right. Um, but the six millimeters really have quite a bit to offer as well. And I mean, even up to the 30, we make a 30 cal V max. So if, you know, if, if my first rifle ended up being a 308, uh, one ten, some one. poor little farm kid, you know, and that's all I have to work with. Hey, we got a varmint bullet for you. Yeah. So anything, anything in that realm. Awesome. Matt, what are you shooting for bullets? Uh, yeah. V maxes. I don't know that there's much more to say about it because you, you are trying to, you know, there is some profit in it. So high damage is the, the tipping point for that to the, the decision. And so, Um, that's what I always ran 50, 55s. And now, you know, with my six millimeters, I've got a couple wildcats that I want to run an 87 grain V max that like, as you say, moving at the speed of light Mm -hmm. and it, it's deadly and it's fun. It's low recoiling and yeah, just 
but there are some guys that like the spire points. They maybe want a little more controlled expansion. And okay. so still an exit hole, but not a big exit hole. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah, a heart shot coyote will run forever. And if you're shooting FMJs or something like that, they're going to run. They'll run 60, 70, 80, 100 yards or better before they pile up. So Yeah. And if you mess it up and you, you gut shoot one or get one in the hind quarters, yeah, yeah you might not see them again. Yeah. No, you won't. They're, they'll live forever. They're like a cockroach. You'll take a shot in the guts and they're yeah. gone. They're yep. in the next state. So sticking with the V-Maxes, now from a cartridge selection standpoint, you guys obviously both started with the 22 cals, as you mentioned, and you transition now to these 6 millimeters. Uh, walk us through that progression and what you think the 6 millimeter gains you, um, and walk us through a little bit of your thoughts on, okay, I'm shooting a 6 millimeter for, you know, we're out west, we're in the sand hills, we're in the, you know, some of the canyons areas of, of Nebraska, and so we're shooting a bolt action gas gun. What are you, what are you guys shooting from a cartridge standpoint for what I'm going to call day hunting. Uh, Cause we are going to talk about night hunting, which is turning coyote yeah. populations down by the minute. Cause that is next level fun. So for day hunting, what do you guys run it from a cartridge and how did that progression happen? Uh, started with the bolt action for me with that Remington 700. I, n- I didn't get a gas gun until well after I was grown and gone and, and left the farm. So um, bolt gun primarily there, but <clears throat> Today, I use a gas gun primarily just because having that follow-up shot being so rapid with the gas gun right. uh, is is a huge advantage, especially if you've got multiple coyotes coming in at once. I mean, mm-hmm. it's doable with a bolt gun. I mean, I killed sets of, you know, three or four coyotes with my bolt gun growing up, but I was super proficient with that, you know. Now, working here and being an adult, I'm spoiled with having too many different rifles. So I'm not as proficient with any one of those as I was when I had this one and only tool. And probably out of practice a little bit. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) yeah. Um, but to answer your other question before throwing it to Matt, the six millimeter for me, uh, it gives you, gives you a little more capability if you're going to be shooting beyond your max point blank range. So I think what's common in the varmint world. And I did this as a kid before I really, you know, uh, dove into, ballistics and bullet drop yeah. and all that stuff we've talked about on those other podcasts was if you can get in a you know a good effective max point blank range you just aim at the vitals and and shoot right yeah. but in some of these western states or whatever you might that coyote might hang up out at four five six you know somewhere that's beyond your max point blank range and i think the six millimeters give you a little bit better wind deflection and stuff like that out there where you are going to have to make a compensation for that shot absolutely and i think one of the things that probably facilitated that for you was uh, having a scope that you could actually dial on. Because I we had this conversation before that, yeah, you get the Tasco mil dot scope, yeah. but you can't dial on that turret. And you can't even really trust that those are actually a mil apart. So right. you kind of had to swag it a little bit. So you said you moved to six millimeter. Which cartridge or cartridges specifically? The six arc. Six arc. Yeah. It, oh, in the gas gun. That's yeah. a perfect combination. And especially when we get to the night stuff. I mean, oh, yeah. that totally changes everything. And you're running 75s or 87s? 87s at night. Because okay. at night I'm working with, no, not to jump too far ahead, but working with night vision, thermal, and, and laser systems. So max point blank range is really important when you're using a laser, right? Because you just yep. have a straight line as yep. you're aiming. Um, but if it's daytime hunting, I'll switch to a 108. Okay. Just a classic 108. The 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 match round for the six arc um not really worried about height or excuse me hide damage with that just trying to get the coyote on the ground yeah i mean that's more for if i expect to be shooting them at a distance at a long ways yeah still running the gas gun with that for the long stuff yeah awesome how long of barrel 18 well my night gun's a 14 and a half okay because i know you know i'm not going to be engaging much past probably 250 at night Sure. So the way I have my setup, I can I can go out to 250 with just my lasers and night vision. I don't have to switch to thermal uh, if I don't need to. Nice. Um, but yeah, if you're going out beyond that, I would go to the, the heavier bullet. Go the 108, and you're going to get all that wind deflection. Mm-hmm. And and during the day, you'll have time, presumably, to if they if they are far away, and you're going to get a shot, get a range. We've got Ford off. Right. Make it easy. Dial on the turret and send one where it needs to be. Yeah. So Matt, how'd that progression look for you from 22 cal up to six millimeter? And when, uh, let's talk about some of the sixes that you run. Yeah. So I've always ran bolt guns. I've had a few ARs, but I, I'm a, I like my bolt guns. And mm-hmm. so transitioning, you know, at, when I finally graduated to a six millimeter was when I, you know, started here. Uh, well, sorry, I take that, take that back. I had a, my brother won a 243 in a raffle 
This one was on the ranch. And he let me borrow it. And I just run spire points, you know, whatever ammo, of course, whatever I could get my hands on pre Hornady. Yeah. You know, what not, was cheap? Not knowing better. Yeah. So, you know, ran that for a long time. Now, you know, working here, being able to, you know, have access to, to barrels and, and, oh yeah, I'm, this is a six millimeter barrel, but it was in a Creedmoor. Can I chamber it for this? And it's got the twist rate for, you know, heavy for caliber bullets. So currently have a six BRA in, on a Savage action and in a fancy stock and everything like that. That's one of my guns. And then I've got a six Remington Ackley also. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Remington 700. And that's one I run 80. It's got a 10 twist. So I run 87 grain V-Maxes in it. It will stabilize a, a 105 boat tail, but. 87 grain V-Maxes, or it's and sweet spot. That's got to be 33, 3,400. Oh, I haven't even chronoed it. I've, it's, 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 just, it's over, it's around 3,400. Yeah. It, it hits so, what he aims at. So yeah, it, it, and know that point blank is. aim, like, yeah. From, <laughs> it transcends yeah, velocity. You know, it, I guess the thing was always hold hair and let, pull the trigger, you know, for, you know, with coyotes. So if, as long as you can hold back line or anywhere in that, in that coyote's thickest part of his body, that's what, if it, it's going to hit there, that's what you want to shoot, you know, yeah. or, or what you want to run for a, a, a cartridge and that six Remington actually does everything, but it's, it's kind of obnoxious cause it's got a really long barrel on it. I'm going to cut it down in preparation for my suppressor, you know, to run that. But, uh, but that's, those are the two cartridges and I run, you know, so I kind of have a mix of both. I have an 87 grain VMAX for that, for saving hides, but then that six BRA has an eight twist and then I run 108 and for, you know, boat tails and being able to reach out there, you know, with the, the competitive side of shooting, it makes you more, me more confident to take those 400 or 500 yard shots pretty, pretty confidently. So, yeah, especially these matches. I mean, you, yeah. there are matches or excuse me, stages where you will have a coyote stage oh, and yeah. it'll be yeah. coyote sized steel out to six, 700 yards. And you're shooting, leaning over a log with one foot down shooting on the ground. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just incredible. So yeah, when you throw yourself in a real life situation, having yeah. done stages like that, it's yeah. a no brainer. No factor. Yep. Yeah, especially you shoot a mover at 500 yards that's moving three mile an hour and you're hitting it all the time. Like when you're shooting a coyote at that distance, that's kind of loping along or walking along a ridge line. No factor. Yeah. You know, he's dead. Love I it. even get excited at the coyote stages it matches. Yeah. It's, pathetic. <laughs> yeah. it's not good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, uh, that's awesome. Especially when they're, you're shooting out the window of a pickup <laughs> or something. Uh, you know, I've, that's, never, that's, I've never done that, man. Nev- not no, once. No. Not, no admission <laughs> of guilt here. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen it done. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so day hunting, can't get enough of it, especially, you know, with these calls, you know, having witnessed coyotes coming into calls and man, sometimes they can be real stupid. A lot of times they come with caution and they'll circle around and get downwind and stuff, but having the ability to reach out further, just like hunting big game, when you have the ability and the equipment and the, and the skill level to reach out there just a little bit for, further than the average guy you can up the amount of animals that you get down uh, pretty immensely because they are not dumb animals and they learn fast. Especially yeah. on, on like a call shy coyote. Cause some coyotes in an area or some coyotes in areas where they get a lot of call pressure, they might come and say they're hanging out at, you know, three quarters of a mile when they hear that call go off and it's enough to interest them. So they come in to, you know, half mile, a little bit inside that, you know, 600 ish yards, but then they hear something that says, no, I've heard this before, and they're getting ready to yeah. tuck tail and run. Yep. That's as close as you're going to get. Yeah. So those six millimeters bucking the wind a little bit, especially out here, like, a, you know, on the prairie, the winds winds are blowing. Yeah. Uh, they're blowing everywhere, but, man, it seems to be in our neck of the woods. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, usually a little bit more than most places, and you got to have the ability to, to buck the wind. Um, I, as well, will join you guys in the six millimeter arc train for, for – uh, Predators, specifically coyotes, I have a bolt gun. I'm a bolt gun guy. I've never really was struck by the gas gun bug. Um, and when I was, it you know flushed out pretty quickly. And I have gas guns, and they're great for, for a lot of things. But I got a 22-inch 6 arc on a, in a Manners PRS-1 stock, Bighorn Action, first focal plane scope. Yeah, running. I ran 75 VMAXs. Screaming them. I think at 3,200. <laughs> yeah. And... Nice. Uh, Man, what a combination. <laughs> Obviously, I've shot 108s and, and even 103s, um, but the 75s or the 87 out of a 6 arc and then out of a bolt gun where I can juice the pressures up a little bit, it is fast, it's flat, it bucks the wind, and it yeah. puts the coyote down right where you hit them. Yeah, you're, and, you're starting to rival 22-250 with that absolutely. combination. Yeah, yeah, it's remarkable, and I just love the setup. 
running a bolt gun is what I do, and it's uh, I'm pretty proficient at manipulating uh, the bolt and getting back on the trigger and staying in the gun. And it's short enough that I can run my suppressor, run it on a tripod. It's just awesome little setup. Now, changing gears into an area that I have very little experience in, night hunting coyotes is night hunting anything with the right equipment is borderline like makes you feel like you're doing something illegal there's no way that you could do something so fun uh as an as a grown man that makes me laugh like i'm a 12 year old girl there's no way this should be legal but i'll tell you what it is a blast and i don't have a ton of experience doing that but uh walk us through a night hunting setup and what that looks like and and why the difference well when i was younger that was usually me with one of the uh, some people might remember a big giant yellow oh, spot with red, the li- red lens with the little like or, yeah. pistol grip on the, it. The one million candle power. Yeah. Yep. My buddy oh yeah. Burned a hole through his truck seat. He left it <laughs> on one time in high school. But yep. I know exactly what you're talking about. Running running one of those one handed and because I had always heard, you know, if you go out at night the coyotes aren't scared, you're gonna get way more of them. Still with my two two three bolt gun. So sitting there with the two two three bolt gun in one hand and that spotlight in the other, you know, call a little bit and then pick up the spotlight and 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 scan high, you know, don't shine the ground because you don't want to hit exactly where the coyote is. You just want to catch the eye shine and then let it off and wait. And then maybe call again and wait. And you're in the pitch black and yeah. you don't know what's going on. You're like, oh, dude, should I turn the, I really want to turn this light on again because <laughs> I want to know where this coyote is, you know, but I don't want to spook him. So then you turn yeah. the light on. Okay. He's 50 yards closer. That's that, I still got a ways to go. And just, you know, that, that process to what we have today with night vision and thermal night and day difference yeah yeah, yeah. no yeah. pun intended huh yeah. <laughs> you don't necessarily own the night in in those older days but with the new technology you definitely do awesome so not running a bolt gun i'm guessing no so so what i'm doing now at night yeah and maybe what makes sense for those that are listening that are thinking about getting into it or they just bought their first thermal or their yeah you know, so bolt guns definitely do a bullet night especially if you're going to have a a an Weapon optic, mounted. yeah, an optic that's that's designated to that firearm. So whether it's a night vision scope or or a thermal optic, and that's mounted to it. Um, what I run is a little bit different. I run a, a head mounted night vision, and then uh, thermal on the gun. And so I'll I'm I'm moving around because that's another issue at night is is you don't want to be like crashing through timber or making a bunch of noise when you're, when you're trying to get just to where you're going to call. You know, so the night vision is very helpful with that. Um, although you kind of lack the the depth perception a little bit, but a, a helmet mounted night vision essentially, so you can walk around with it. Uh, and then on the gun itself, um, I have a couple different lasers, and and the reason I have a couple is because again, with a laser, you you have a dot, right? You have a, essentially a, a straight line uh, aiming reference. So what I'll do is is set my lasers at different zeros. So I'll have a laser oh. that's zeroed at fifty. A laser that's zeroed. It's, it depends on what I'm hunting, right? If I'm if it's coyotes, I have a little bit more vertical um, space to deal with than say like a raccoon or something like that. So I'll change the zeros of those lasers depending on what I'm going after. Gotcha. But what that allows me to do is, well, it gives me three different aiming points for different ranges. But also, you can to not get too technical. You said not to do this. Yeah, but I can't help myself. <laughs> You, you can also set those up to where you can you can get essentially a mill-based, so I operate in mills for all my long-range stuff, so a mill-based separation of laser 1, laser 2, and laser 3. And so then you can back calculate out what your ranges would be from a range estimation standpoint, because most coyotes are going to be a X height, right? Let's say a 10-inch yeah. height, you know? And so if you can see that coyote in the night vision, and you can use those lasers to measure the coyote's oh. height, you can get a basic range estimation off of it. And then from that, you can pick which laser to use as your point of aim. Um, and then the thermal is is mounted to the firearm itself. So if I have time to use the thermal, that's way better. Because yeah. your resolution with a, with a head-mounted night vision is, is not nearly as good as what sure. you're going to be able to use with the thermal. Yeah, so weapon-mounted thermal, that's, the, in the limited experience I have, it's with that. And my gosh. Oh, it's wild. Whoa. You yeah. see, you'll see mice running around. Yeah. You can see track. Like an animal that's walked past. I mean, it's got to be pretty, uh, not much time has yeah. elapsed since yeah. that happened, but you can see where foots, you know, where footprints are on the ground in yeah. heat. Um, 
Yeah, it's an incredible tool. I've also called it a raccoon for 45 minutes in the thermal, thinking it was a coyote way out on that cornfield. You know, so all you see is a heat signature. Yeah. Can't necessarily tell what it is, but it's slowly working its way to you only to watch it climb up a tree. Yeah. And you're like, I just wasted 45 <laughs> minutes. It's, you know, 10 below. I'm cold. I'm going back to the truck. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the problem with thermal is it's really hard to ID stuff. Yeah. To get okay. Positive identification. <clears throat> night vision is much better at that. Um, but night vision... There's no like highlighting colors saying, you know, hey, this There's is what you're looking for. Here. We're in thermal, you know, that picks it up really easily. Yeah. yeah. So again, going back to the six millimeter thing, um, do you think that's the best cartridge options for that? For night? Yeah, I, I do because of what the six arc offers in a gas gun. It's pretty hard to rival that thing. And with okay. say, say I was going to stick with the gas gun, which I like at night because because you're not going to have a precision point of impact at night like you are during the day looking through a traditional optic, right? Yeah. Like a magnified or optic. Or range finding would be really difficult. So yeah. you know, you're not yeah. going to take the time to dial on an optic. So I know my, my error in my shot placement is going to be higher at night. And so going six millimeter does two things. One, to keep it in the gas gun realm. If I was to go out with a two two three or a five five six, um, the amount of bullet drop is going to be more. So I'm going to cut back my max effective range at night just because I of the of the drag of, of those 22 cal bullets compared to the six millimeters but the other thing is the is the terminal side of it i can i can mess my shot up more and still have more terminal damage because that six millimeter is just going to offer more yep. Than, yep than the 22s awesome so it sounds like a new world as far as cartridge and selection goes nothing much changed in bullets our 55 grain v max and 22 cal the v max line as a whole mm -hmm. is just the go-to for putting yep. down coyotes but you know growing up and having a lot of friends that did this 22 cal 2250 was what everybody ran some people moved to the 204 ruger which is a fantastic cartridge on the coyote side of things you know a lot of people still favor the 22 cals and now this shift into six arc um, i know a lot of guys i mentioned tate streeter earlier he's running a six creed more 87 grain v max is faster than the speed of light if you yeah. can believe that mm -hmm. um just uh just picking up the wind deflection and then all that speed yeah it sounds like that's the way to go so and i would have to agree if i was going to get set up as a designated night hunting system makes sense to go with the gas gun in my opinion yeah. less things to manipulate when it's in when it's dark out you know yeah. as soon as you slam the mag in get around in the chamber you know where the safety is i've shot i don't even know how many thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds for a gas gun all the controls are in the same spot they can close your eyes and you can feel exactly where they should be um so it makes sense to do that and then you're not you're actually gaining terminal performance by going with something like a six arc yeah yeah That's i think awesome. yep. the gas gun or the bolt gun serves you just fine at night especially for your first shot but the follow-ups which i think are more likely at night just because it's harder mm -hmm. to deal with and if you have multiple coyotes it's hard oh, to, yeah. it's hard to beat a gas gun yeah love it yeah. yep I, and I agree with what Jaden said as far as like having a six millimeter. I, I, the only night hunt I've ever done is with, you know, AR, two, you know, 223s on AR platforms with clamped in a, a bog pod, you know, like a hog saddle, but, mm -hmm. um, being able to maybe mesh your shot up a little bit or not make a good shot that definitely would bode well for the six, the six millimeter stuff. Cause you do just have the better terminal performance and let's be honest, you know, hide values are not worth anything right now. So you're yeah, yeah. purely doing it. A, out of enjoyment and for predator control, you know, population control, right? Sure. So, yeah. so but the, the thermals and having that follow-up shot on an AR is just optimal for yeah. night yeah. hunting. So it's just, a, it's a rush at night. Man. Oh yeah. There's, Everything's yeah. a rush at Especially night. Especially you go out by yourself, like you can yeah. be the, the biggest, toughest dude around. Go up in the mountains by yourself at night and go put your back against a tree somewhere and light off a rabbit distress call. And tell me that in the back of your mind, you're not wondering what's coming down. Yeah. You know? That is a little creepy. <laughs> and it, I mean, anything at night has got a cool factor to it, I think. Yeah. Uh, but it sounds awesome. I, I'm looking forward to doing more of it. The prices are getting more stable, I think, in the night hunting optic world. Yeah. That, and even if the prices are static, the technology that you're getting for that same cost is just getting better and better and better. With companies like Pulsar, for example, mm -hmm. just phenomenal stuff. Um, I will say... Like I'd mentioned earlier, a lot of my coyote hunting is a target of opportunity. So I've shot more with a 6.5 Creedmoor and 143 ELDXs or, you know, something like that than I probably have 
anything else, but man, that six arc, any six millimeter cartridge for that matter. Obviously, the 25 cal cartridges are great for that too. And the 257 Roberts back in its day was, you know, that was the perfect, you could hunt anything with it deer, antelope, coyotes, shoot prairie dogs, bobcats, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, a lot of fun there. And this is uh, completely anecdotal, but I was hunting a mule deer with dad several years ago. And we were in this area and the sun was coming up behind us and it illuminated this area of the sand hills. And about 1,700 yards away, there was this huge, I'm going to call it a bluff wall, but it was still lightly grassed in the sand hills. And it was way higher in elevation than we were at. And when the sun hit it, I was like, man, that's got to be, there's something over there. And so I get in the binos on the, on the tripod and it was like a really silverish, whitish coyote. I mean, from a long ways away and we were shooting, uh, only dad had his rifle and that was a, I think that was a six GT or six, five Creedmoor at the time. If we had a 300 PRC, I'm not saying I'm going to hit it, but I'll put one in his bubble from yeah. right here. Yeah. And he'll, he'll know somebody. And, and I was, I really wanted to do that, <laughs> but, uh, that's the benefit of hunting suppressed. You know, when, when you are out hunting and like I said, most of my shooting of coyotes has been our opportunity hunting suppressed, I don't feel as guilty like I'm messing something up horribly. Yeah. You know, if yeah. it's 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning and I'm hiking out of somewhere and I lay down and shoot a coyote, I don't feel bad about blowing all the deer out because uh, in my experience, when I do shoot something suppressed, when I shoot a deer, the other deer that are in the area seem to be unaffected. Yeah. 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 Suppressor. I wish I had a suppressor when I was a kid. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I would have had my, so much gas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my ears would be way better. My hearing would be way better than what it is too. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, awesome. Well, any plans coming up here? You guys going to go out on any dedicated coyote stuff? I hope so. I I saw uh, I saw a coyote on the way to work the other day, and I got all yeah, you yeah. Know, giddy, yeah, riled up about it. And then I forgot something, so I had to go back home, like you know, five miles down the road, turn around and go back home. You better get a another coyote right there. Oh. I, don't know, I don't know if it was the same one. He was in the same area. I don't know if it was mm-hmm. the same one. But yeah. said, it sounds like you're getting infiltrated. You need to set up tonight and put them down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm I mean, it's always uh it's always on the list for me. You know, um upland season starting, I have prairie chickens. I've got a couple of bird dogs and been out hunting them and then getting back to the pickup and the coyote start sounding off and you're kind of marking them on the map in your mind. Yep, that one's there. That one's there. I've got permission there. I can call him kind of mm-hmm. deal. So it's always, it's always on my mind. Yep. But it seems to be, and as a hunter and as a conservationist and as a guy that likes to do things that are fun, it should be always on the mind. Yeah. Is, uh, it is satisfying uh, playing chess basically with another animal that wants to play chess back. You know, they're trying to elude other predators, even though they're a predator themselves. So they have to they have to take some risk to get the reward, and especially when it starts getting cold, yeah. they need to eat. And so they get a little bit more bold and a little bit braver. And on the same token, when it gets cold, it's it's no fun for us to be out there, but we still want to play that cat and mouse game with these coyotes. And yep. it's a lot of fun. So, yeah. well, I appreciate you guys uh, sharing your background with the coyotes. It makes me just smile talking about it, thinking about it. Some of the, the replays in my head of, of, yeah, of some of the fun coyote experiences I've had and just fuels the fire for fall and wintertime because yeah, that's, yeah. that's when it gets great. I'm excited. All right, everybody. Hopefully you enjoyed this discussion on cartridge and bullet selection for coyote hunting, and we'll catch you guys on the next one.